Good evening. Hello, everyone. My name is Eleonora Bertranu, and I direct the Latino Latin American Studies program. Welcome to the first event of the semester. We are very fortunate to have Karina Solavere with us tonight. Um, she st she's from Argentina. She studied at the Universidad de Buenos Aires so, uh, in sociology. Um, then she worked in the Patagonia in Bariloche at the Universidad de Colahue. Comahue, I'm sorry. Um, she um, completed her PhD in Mexico at uh, FLAXO, the Facultad de Ciencias Sociales. And since 2003, she has taught and done research at FLAXO in Mexico. And we're very fortunate because this year she's at the University of Minnesota um, taking her sabbatical here in the Twin Cities. And so we were able to bring her up to speak about um, violence and peace movement in Me Mexico. Karina's um, uh, expertise is in human rights, in comparative studies in human rights, and her, some of her publications are More Power, More Rights, The Supreme Court and Society in Mexico, United States. Um, another one is La Política Desde la Justicia, Court, Supreme Courts, Government and Democracy in Argentina and Mexico. Um, so she's worked across disciplines, um, and um, she's leading the theme for the semester, which is um, violence and peace movements in Latin America. So from Karina, we'll hear about what's going on in Mexico. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, can you listen to me? <laughs> Um, good evening. Uh, it's, I am really happy to be here this uh, afternoon. I am really delighted with the invitation of Eleonora and of the university. For me, it's a great pleasure to, to be here and to share with you some thoughts about the Mexican, the Mexican peace movement and Mexican violence situation. Uh, today, um, it's, uh, the, my presentation would be um, uh, will be a descript descript descriptive uh, one because you know the, the the problem of violence in Mexico, the massive violence in Mexico, is relatively new, uh, uh, spread in the last six years. So we are learning what, what happened in Mexico, but th there are a lot of interesting dynamics that I want to share with you. So um, the structure of the, my presentation would be, uh, will be this. I, I want to start with um, presenting my perspective in what is my focus or my approach to the, the problem of violence and peace movement in Mexico. Uh, the second point is uh, I want to summarize some of the main characteristics of violence in Mexico. Uh, the, thir the third point uh, will be the uh, political context, reflects about the political context in Mexico. Then I want to reflect about the social context in Mexico that is very important to, to understand what happened. The, um, the five point would be the institutional responses, the inter institutional answers to the violence, and uh, then the peace movement characteristic and some conclusions about the, the situation. This is like a map to help you <laughs> to, because perhaps it's, so, it's too much information, uh, but if you need, if you have a question, please, uh, it's, I will be happy to, to answer if you ask. Uh, 
what is my perspective or, or from what perspective, perspective I want to talk with you this night. Uh, my approach will be uh, human rights and peace building in, uh, regarding the problem of violence in Mexico. As you know, the problem of, of violence could be treated or, um, or studied in, by many perspectives. One is internal security, public safety, national security, but my perspective don't be that. Uh, it will be uh, human rights and peace building. So it's, for me it's very important to maintain, uh, to, to explain this uh, to you. And uh, my main argument is that the evolution of actual violence in Mexico has some figures of the old state violence in Mexico in a new context. I think it's, it's a new phenomena, but it has some common or share some characteristics of all violence, uh, uh, violence situations in Mexico uh, in a new context. This new context is characterized by two main uh, uh, situations. The state capacity problems, the, the state, the Mexican state has uh, some witness uh, in the bu building, in, in the building uh, capacities to uh, face the violence and new uh, security problems uh, in a context of political and social pluralism. I, I want to return to this to, to explain uh, that uh, deeply. But I think it's very important. Uh, what, ha what are the characteristics of violence in Mexico? Uh, Mexico experienced an increase of violence in the, la in, the lax in the last six years, framed in that its call, its name in Mexico, were against the narco, narco cartels. When we talk about narco, we talk about narco cartels. Uh, this violence spread around the country, started in the north, in the border with the United States, but now spread around the country as a result of disputes for territory between narco cartels. This was the beginning of the process. The narco cartels fight against each other and this produced a lot of murders, killings, massive killings. Or, so this was the first uh, step of violence. And uh, the aesthetics of this violence uh, is especially impressive and open to the public. One, uh, I, there are a lot. This is a video that was transmitted, that was uh, uploaded in YouTube, uh, yeah, showing an execution of a member of one cartel for another cartel. That, it is, I, I choose this picture because it's not so terrible, but <laughs> there are terrible pictures. So one of the characteristics of the violence, of the violence uh, in between, uh, the fighting between cartels is that they show the, the result of the violence publicly by media like uh, YouTube or uh, internet, or they put dead bodies or heads or in public spaces. So it's a, it's a violence that has not only uh, the objective, uh, objective, the goal, the goal of the violence is not only to uh, win territory or destroy uh, the other cartel, but uh, 
generate a fear around the population too because you know you go or you receive these images from YouTube it's, it's very very touching but, uh, the tendency the tendency of the growing violence, of the, the growth uh, of the violence uh, was coincident with the Felipe Calderón government. Uh, Felipe Calderón was president uh, of Mexico from 2006 and to, uh, from to, uh, to 2012. Uh, one of the main strategies or I, I, in my opinion, one of the uh, first priorities or the most important priorities of Calderón's government was the, guerre, the war against narco. So um, this received a lot of attention. This, this kind of policies or these strategies receive a lot of attention by the government. One of the main strategies and a key point in, in this story is the militarization of public security and organized crime combat. What is this? The, uh, uh, the army was in charge, is now actually in charge of the war against narco cartels into the frontiers of the country. You know the army normally uh, is in charge to defend, defend the country uh, to other countries of external dangers, but in this case the army is uh, a key actor into the Mexican frontiers in the war against narco. This is a uh, this is common now in Mexico to see this kind of uh, military officials in the streets, on highways, and even in Mexico City. I want to share with you some numbers to, to, to try to transmit, to show what is the magnitude of the intensity of the phenomena that I was talking about. Uh, uh, this, uh, the, the strategy of uh, face narco cartels by force, you know that the, the narco cartels are not only military of organizations, are economic organization and very sophisticated one that they have a lot of uh, uh, economic interest. So the, the force or the military way is one of the possible ways to combat narco culture. The, the economic way could be another. But the, the strategy of Calderon government was uh, especially the uh, military one. Face the narco cartels by uh, with the army by force. Uh, that, the main result, result of this policy was the um, extension of violence, the spread of violence into the territory and to another social group. This is very important. At the beginning, the, the violence was between uh, members of different cartels. But now, the violence uh, spread uh, to other social groups, a civilian population, and social and political leaders. Uh, for example, homicide ra uh, rates increased 260 percent between 2006 and 2010. It's, it's a huge explosion of the 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 homicide rate, rates, uh, Mexican government officially recognized, this is, these are not numbers of NGOs or just officially recognized more than 
35,000 uh, deaths linked with organized crime during the Calderon period, in the last six years. Uh, killings increased every year, as you can see from 2,826 uh, in 2007 to 15,273 in 2010. So the, 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 these are official the data. So it's, uh, the, the level of violence increase uh, geometrically in, in, in a short time. Uh, in this context, the human rights violations grew. But we know that the people that study human rights, uh, we know this is not uh, surprising because w the, the people that study human rights knows that general or uh, structural violence or civil wars increase a lot. Is, uh, they are associated uh, with incre increase uh, the growth of the human rights violation because in, in situation of uh, strong violence, the, the, the result are uh, women raped or torture or extrajudicial killing. So that is a relation, a tight relation between violence and human rights violation. But some examples. In 2006, uh, we, Mexico registered six complaints before the National Human Rights Commission. It's a national commission that received complaints about human rights violation, but it's an official organization. And in to, between 2007 and 2012, this amount grows to 251 complaints before the, the same organization. But these are all official uh, data that is but you know that when you characterize a, a country as a unsafe country regarding torture the the name of torture cases is more than five in a year so the the levels of mexico are really really high torture is not well say in, in some places could be generalized, but it's, uh, it's not so common. So more than five cases in a year in a country is considered a high level of torture for a country. So the, the levels in Mexico. Other characteristics, or one of the most common human rights violation, violation was torture. The other was forced disappearances. Uh, in 2010, third, uh, 346 cases of presumed, uh, presumed forced disappearances were registered in the National Commission of Human Rights. So only in, in 2010. The National Commission of Human Rights talked about 14 disappearances during this peri period. So I want to compare with you what that were the characteristics of the old violence in Mexico because it is important, one, one, point, one of my points is that some of the problems of the official response or answer to actual violence in Mexico are related to the lack of response of the past, bio, the old violence in Mexico. Uh, Mexico has a record uh, in the 70s and 60s has a record of targeted violence uh, with forced disappearances, political imprisonment, and extrajudicial kill killings. But these were uh, strategies used for the Mexican government against the uh, leftist a political opposition. It, so it was really targeted and was directed 
for the state against the political, the leftist political opposition. Uh, this is a uh, this is a picture of the 1968 repression against the student movement. It's a very so it's uh, it was a target. Uh, violence are uh, something really different in comparison with this uh, generalized violence situation. Okay, so I think uh, some characterizations or some characteristics. Uh, the old violence, the causes of the old violence were finally social and armed movements against the political order, was, uh, the, this was the causes of the violence. The, the new violence is uh, much more complicated. Uh, the, the, the violence were pro is produced by fights between cartels, fights between cartels and armed forces, so the army, attack of cartels against civilian population, attack of armed force against civilian population to, to, to obtain information about cartels operation. That would be was one of the reasons to the increase of the torture practice, to obtain confessions. And attack of paramilitary groups against civilian population because in this situation of uh, different uh, groups fighting each other, the powerful people organize or paramilitary groups as a strategy of defense. Uh, in the case of the old violence, with who were the perpetrators? Well, find generally, Military and security, military people and security forces. And who were the victims, especially leftist political opposition, members of the guerrilla groups or the social movements against, linked with the left. And who are the victims now? This is, it's, it's caught. <laughs> But uh, now the, the, the victims are very different, are civilian people, armed force members, cartel members, human rights defenders, and journalists. And so it's, uh, it's, uh, the, 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 the victims of the violence are so many different and are not as target as in the 60s and 70s. Well, what about the political context? I think it is, it is, it is very important. Uh, drug trafficking and politics in Mexico have a history of a strong relationship, uh, especially in the northern, northern states because uh, the, the market of the United States of America. You know that the, the main market for consumption of drugs is United States. So for Mexico, be so near the United States and have this uh, big, long <laughs> border, uh, Mexico is a strategic place for the, the narco. Uh, the relationship between <laughs> narco cartels or drug trafficking uh, and, uh, and politics in Mexico start, start, in, the, start uh, in the late 20th of the last century, in the 20th century, with the opium ban in the United States. So the United States prohibit opium here and the Mexican border, especially Mexican governors in the borders, start to leadership, that became leaders in the 
traffic of uh, opium from Mexico to the United States illegally. Uh, and the links between political elites and drug organizations continues. So it, in, in, different, in different ways, not as open as in, in 20s, but it's a, it's a, it is a Mexican political elite has a relationship uh, with the narco cartels. If you, you can see Revista Proceso in Mexico, uh, published from the 80s, different, uh, it's a, a, a weekly magazine, political magazine that start in, in the 80s and from this time is publishing uh, different reports about the links of uh, drug cartels and um, political elites. But what happened? You know that Mexico has had a, a system of hegemonic parties. So many, during 70 years, Mexico was governed, was governed, was ruled by one party, that is the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, the PRI, Institutional Revolutionary Party. It was the party that controlled government at all the political uh, arena in, in the country. Um, with the political openness in the political system during the 90s, that Mexico has a late transition uh, transitioned to democracy, uh, the political landscape of the country changed. Uh, a a three-party system develops, and the possibility of new allian alliances between cartels and political elites develop at many different levels. In, in the past, the relationship was, was centralized, and now it's really decentralized uh, between, uh, for example, a uh, president of a, a, a municipal government, a, a local government, with some narco groups and some narco leader in this area to obtain um, uh, freedom of uh, transit from this territory. So now the co political uh, landscape of the country is very so much complex with many new actors, political actors, playing in the political arena. So uh, the spread of narco cartels during this time, uh, the problem to control the violence and to control the, the, the activity of narco cartels uh, is linked, is or was an uh, uh, unexpected consequence of democratization in Mexico. And what about the social context? Um, the hegemonic party, I, I said every time that in Mexico we explain all about <laughs> talking about the PRI, no? the, the, the hegemonic party. The, the PRI was, uh, was guilty <laughs> of all the Mexican problems. I, um, but it, certainly it is now, until now a very, very a key actor of Mexico that you can <laughs> Uh, omit when we talk about Mexico. Um, the hegemonic party, the PRI, developed a corporatist system of social representation, but was a successful strategy until the 70s. So what is this? The, the party, the hegemonic party, controlled all social organizations, unions, popular uh, grassroots organizations, business organizations. So it's a, it's a system called corporativismo mexicano that maintain a lot of the, the order because this 
this organization was controlled for the party and was functional to ma the, maintain, the maintenance of the, this disorder. But after the 70s, new social leadership developed around new demands. The, the, the guerrilla groups, the, the student mov movement, movement, social movement for democratization, uh, and independent civil society started to rise in Mexico. So for that, I, I was talking, or I was I talked at the beginning of a social and political of pluralist social and political context because new organizations appeared and new parties appeared so the, the, this order that worked almost fine during 70 years collapsed and the human rights movement for example, and its organizations became more visible in this new context. The human rights became a legitimate demand and um, uh, started to be uh, a claim against the state. Uh, for example, the new demands and organization spread in the umbrella, the umbrella of human rights. We now we have an organization that claim for indigenous rights, that claim for women, women rights, that claim for environmental rights, that claim for truth and justice rights, for victims of crime rights. So we have a fragmentation of demands, all against or claiming to the state to different solutions. So the social, com in comparison this, with this corporatist order where all the organization was controlled for the party, now we have a more chaotic environment, social environment and political environment too. What was the relationship between the political and social context with, with the old and new violence? Bueno, after the, the old uh, violence, the uh, social response or the social context for, was the, the um, beginning of the first human rights organization in the country. Organization of families or mothers of disappeared people or um, families of uh, political prisoners uh, became to, or what the uh, beginning, had the beginning of the human rights movement in, in the country. And in the political, but in the, with the new uh, violence, we have the starting to to appear a just justice and peace movement that recreate the human rights demands or the, the human rights demands of this movement that uh, was born in the 70s uh, and involved this human rights movement plus new actors. For example, families of members of armed force that was killed by the organized crime, but it's a, it's a more general mov movement. And the, in the political arena, the result of the, in the political context of these uh, demands or the violence uh, was the political liberalization. Certainly after the guerrilla groups and after the student movements in the late 70s in Mexico, the, the answer of government was political liberalization to include left into the political system. And, but now the, the problem is that the political context was a, fragment, a fragmented one and is a fragmented one and uh, we have a fragmentation or, or, or uh, polarization of the political debate between security or 
human rights. Now in, in Mexico, we have clearly two, two sides in, in this, uh, around this problem. The security side, you know, that they said that we need to assure or be sure that the, the cartel were destroyed because they are a, a danger for our security. The, these, uh, these organizations are dangerous for the country, so we need to use all the strong, uh, or the strong or the force of the state against that and the human right violation, violations, right, it, it is possible, but are collateral, collateral, uh, collateral damages. So, and uh, in the other side, we have the human rights <laughs> claims that said, you know, that security can't justify human rights violation because each human being is a end in ourselves, in uh, themselves. So we can uh, admit. Uh, human rights violations as a, a mean to obtain another uh, end that is security for the country. No, so now political, the, the political arena in Mexico is divided between these two, two positions. So it's, 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 it, it's, a difficult situa it's a difficult situation because both of them have important public support. So there are a lot of uh, citizenship or a lot of people in Mexico that support that we, we can live without security. We need more security and more repression and, and another part of the population, of the citizenship that uh, is asking for more human rights. So it's... Uh, political complicated, uh, a situation, com a complicated situation politically and socially. What was the institutional responses? Uh, what were the institutional responses? Um, I think uh, the, the main problem in Mexico is the, that the institutional responses contrapose or polarize between insecurity or accountability. So if uh, the, the public policy was one important part of public policy was directed to improve public security. And the war against the narco was defined as a problem of public security. But the, the other part of that was the human rights violation. When you develop a strong uh, public security politic without a, adequate reform of your armed force and your police that are armed force and police that came, that are like authoritarian enclaves that because they came from the authoritarian regime, the problem is that you need an accountability, you need accountability for human rights perpetrators, violation perpetrators. So the problem in Mexico was the war against the narco don't improve public, public safety. So the promise of public safety was impossible to be <laughs> uh, rich. Uh, so a new model of armed force and security forces is needed. The state needs to develop new capacities in national security forces to face these new problems that are different, that the guerrilla groups or narco organization are very sophisticated ones, are very, very very difficult, very flexible, so very de decentralized, so it's difficult. And in the human rights, uh, in the human rights side, the accountability side, as human rights violations increase, 
And the justice uh, system could not make accountable human rights perpetration, perpetration, we have an impunity situation. So the, we have a uh, not successful security policy and a problem of impunity in human rights violations. So, so the common sense is that human rights violations and collateral damages for war against narco. No, that, so all the murders, all the disappearances, or, and mainly the torture case were, were presented as, or are presented as a narco violence result. Certainly, we don't know what are the disappears, what are the, the torturer, the tortured people. We don't know. So, in this context, that this this the optimistic way of the presentation, because after that, we say, and say after that, we say, it's. Uh, I was preparing that, I said, I, it's horrible, I, I feel horrible to <laughs> present that, but this is the optimistic part of the presentation. In this context, and I think that this is the cultural vitality of Mexico that I am admire so much, uh, appear a new movement. But a new movement, this peace movement that I referred in, in the table, it, it's called Movement for Peace with Justice and Dignity. So it's a new movement linked with the Catholic Church, the progressive sectors of the Catholic Church in, in Mexico, that uh, progressive uh, sector of Catholic Church in Mexico are very important human rights actors. Um, and this movement started in 2010, so it's a really new movement, it's a new experience. We are learning about, about what happened with this movement. Uh, and its leader is a poet and journalist, Javier Sicilia, whose uh, son was killed by, narco, by a narco gang. His son was a student of the UNAM, and uh, he was with uh, other friends, and in a fighting, uh, he was killed for a narco gang. So he decided uh, to, to, to do something. <laughs> and this, the, the, he's, Leadering, he's the leader, or became the leader, of this new movement for peace with justice and dignity. And he is um, a very, very well known intellectual in Mexico. Uh, he writes regularly in Revista Proceso, the revista I referred uh, before, this magazine I referred before. And, uh, and the, the new thing is they are seeking justice for all the victims of violence. All victims of violence. Not only human rights defenders, not only uh, journalist, uh, uh, journalist uh, justice, not only um, middle class uh, children, no, all victims of violence. What this means that victims of violence, of armed force, police, women that lost their husband uh, in the fight against narco, and so they are building a very, very broad movement with in a, that is putting together very different kind of demands. And I think it, this is new in the human rights landscape. And in comparison with the fragmentation of demands that I refer, it appeared that this movement is trying to combine, to put together this all kinds 
of demands that we can put over the, the, um, uh, down the umbrella of peace. No? They, they, the main, they, uh, their main. Uh, this is a, one of the demonstration of the movement. That the 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 phrase the the phrase the typical phrase is estamos hasta la madre. That is in Mexico. This means we ha, we are absolutely I don't know fed up. No, that we are absolutely fed up. Stop the war and peace with justice and dignity. This this is Javier Sicilia and uh, all other intellectuals and a lot of people uh, that are families of victims, they walk <laughs> all around the country listening uh, victims of violence. The, the first uh, activity of strategy was uh, walk around the country listening testimonies of victims or families of victims of violence so they have the first register of the, this violent situation in Mexico. And they promote, it's certainly not a radical movement. It's, uh, this is, what well, for Mexican characteristic, it is very important because Mexico, all in Mexico is very gradual and incremental. So this is very important. They promote dialogue with the, govern the government. And they came, one of the strategies of the last year, they came to the United States to develop, to develop soli solidarity links with the United States. Because they, are, they realize that if they don't connect with the United States organizations, uh, they can do, they can't do so much because the, the more important problem around narco violence in Mexico is, is that they, it's a, the border country with the United States. If they don't spread solidarity and cons conscience in the United States, it's very difficult. At the civil society level, level it will be really difficult, it would be really difficult to change something in, in, in Mexico. Say so they came to the United States, this is the poster of the caravan of peace, they went to Los Angeles, they started uh, they went to Ciudad Juarez and Texas and California and then they finished in Washington DC in a hearing in the Congress and uh, the, the US Congress and a hearing in the uh, Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. I am finishing <laughs> now. Uh, the main remains the demands of the movement are the recognition of rights of victims of violence the law, victims law that was just approved, uh, the new government in Mexico just approved the new law, stop the war, juridic and, and psychological care of victims, they, they have an, a team, they, they are working with a team of lawyers and psychologists to help victims and families to, to, uh, with the trauma of the, the human rights violation. Dialogue with other organizations and victims and families all around the country and dialogue with government. And I think the, more, the, the most important cultural change is that they are framing the problem of human rights violations in Mexico around the peace, the, the build, build, how to build peace. That is certainly a demand that all Mexicans or all people that live in Mexico, in Mexico as me, we can share with this movement. We want peace. This is very difficult to live in this situation. So. I am finishing <laughs> the conclusions. Um, we have in Mexico 
a rise of violence with new characteristics and more disorder <laughs> violence. So we need to take into account the new characteristic of this uh, spread violence. Uh, a new context of political pluralism that is, is polarized around peace or not peace, <laughs> uh, that is important. Uh, social pluralism, a new social pluralism with new demands, but that the, this, this mov movement of peace is trying to contain all dif these different demands. demands. Uh, we are living controversial, controversial projects about state capacity, more security or more rights. Certainly we have uh, the, the human rights part, I, I am in the human rights part, obviously. We have in our favor the international pressure over Mexican state. Now Mexico has a lot of international pressure. Uh, um, United Nations groups, are visiting Mexico, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in the last three years uh, ruled three sentences against uh, Mexican state about human rights violations and linked with the military intervention in, uh, in, in the narco war. And um, new social, and we have two new social responses around peace and new social and political and uh, peace and new social and political alliances so this is the optimistic part of the situation in this horror we have this movement that could be a piece of hope for the future of mexico so thank you very much I don't know if you, someone has some question. I, I was, it was too long, the exposition, but, but I don't know. Yes. Um, does the peace movement take some policy stance with like Plan Merida and asking the United States to support Mexico in ways other than supporting its army and its Yes, yes, this is one of the, the international, the, the, one of the interesting things in the Movimiento por la Paz, the PIF movement, it has an international policy too, not only a domestic one. So because in, in this, it's, it's an international problem, so, so they need international solidarity. And so the caravan to the United States was one of the main goals of the caravan. It was to visibilize this problem and to talk with key actors in, in the United States to say, you are, you know, Plan Merida is the help, the economic help that uh, gave, give um, the U.S. government to Mexico in the war against narco. The Plan Merida has a human rights peace uh, obligation for the Mexican state, but this is not enforceable. The United States continue to give uh, money, uh, a pesar, how to say a pesar? In spite uh, of Mexico didn't uh, comply with the human rights uh, um, obligation of the treaty. So one of the main demands is from the United States it, uh, is to the United States government said, please stop help to buy, to equip to this armed force that is certainly one part of the problem now. Because in the, the official discourse, the problem are the cartels, the drug cartels. But we, we, with the information that we have now, we know that the cartels are certainly a big problem, a very important problem. We can't deny that. But the army in the streets are, a, are other important problems for many reasons. For repression, 
one. From, but the other is that they are, the army is now, uh, is being corrupted for the narco cartel. So we have now a more corrupted army than, than before. So, and so they, they, they have, a, as part of the, the, this politics, uh, the, the, the link with the United States. And I, 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 if I am not wrong, after the caravan to the United States, Hillary Clinton uh, made a declaration, a public declaration, asking Mexico about um, human rights respect or something, but something no, not very, very important, but very symbolic uh, in, 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 in this debate. I think it, yes. <laughs> yes um, it, there seems to be a, a very direct link between the increase in uh, narco violence and the political changes from the PRI to the PAN. And so my question is, um, is there any possibility that the narco violence will decrease with the change of government? <laughs> No, the, this is a question, a very common question now in, in Mexico, no? So with the PRI again in power, in government, so the, the narco violence or the narco guns could be obtain an agreement with the government and we will be all happy <laughs> uh, and the problem, finally, the problem is the United States, not the, the main problem is the, from the United States, not, not for Mexico. But the problem that is the narco gangs are a problem in Mexico too, because the fighting against them, the fragmentation of the narco gangs. In the 70s, we have only two cartels in Mexico. Well, you know very well, Cartel del Golfo and Cartel of Sinaloa. But after the policy of the uh, United States to kill the head of cartels, the result of this policy, this poli uh, policies, the policy is that the uh, cartel fragment because they, they, before, they have only one leader. But when this leader was killed, all the different lieutenants of the leader starting to fight for territory and power. So now the map of the cartels is much more complicated for everyone, even for the PRI. And in the context of political pluralism mm -hmm. that now the president can control every municipality in the country. The main problem in Mexico is in the, in the local level now, because it's at the level of municipalities with the car, uh, the government is weakest. So a little municipality government, imagine a little county in a rural area. And uh, the problem is that the, the, the federal government can't control every municipality that has the, the ruled, that is ruled by different uh, political parties. And each municipality in Mexico has its own police. So we have uh, 3,000 police. <laughs> police uh, police in uh, police uh, corps in, in, in the country. So th this is a problem that even the PRI now in, in, uh, in power it's in, can't resolve. I think uh, probably the, the, I think the resolution that, that one of the debate is more democracy or less democracy. No, because the, this is if the problem was democracy, we must to close. So centralized control, 
and it is a debate now, now in Mexico. Someone said, oh, we need more control. We need, we ha we need to have a, a, a strong state, centralized state, and others say, no, we need more civil society participation, other ways to renew the, the political life in the country with other more decentralized control over these activities. So, but it's a dilemma, certainly it's a dilemma. No, I think that we know in the, we know the, 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 the people that studied human rights at me, we know at, the, at this time of the research, we know that the more successful movement in human rights are that have a, the, this one that have a strong links in the international arena. We no one movement not only a national movement can uh, maintain uh, a fight alone. They need to develop alliances. I think in the case of this movement, it's very important the, st the strategy with the United States because the United States is a key actor. The problem of the, narco, the war against narco is a problem, it could be I, I don't want to sound unpolite <laughs> with the, the United States, but it's mainly a problem that United States transfer other countries. Because it's, it was in the 80s with the United States change, <coughs> their exterior international poli policy against the narco trafficking that before for the United States state drug problem was a health problem, not a security problem. In the, the Reagan government became a problem of uh, national security. So it's imposed a lot of uh, strategies to other countries. One of them, the militarization of the fight against narco and certainly, you know, for Mexico, United States is the main economic, uh, economic partner. So for Mexico, Mexico can't avoid, can't avoid United States opinion. So it's, uh, it's uh, I think that the, this strategy with the United States in this case is very important for the nature of the problem. If they doesn't, create solidarity and conscious, um, conscience here with other NGOs or with uh, key leaders in the human rights movement here, the problem became the same. But they are trying to develop links with Europe, but, but certainly in, in this case, United States, we, we can avoid the United States uh, in this problem. 